Welcome to the disease and nematode section of the 2024 cotton workshop. I appreciate you all being here today. Um, I do want to say that Tuesday, last Tuesday, I was in front of a group in Early County, and you've heard this before. And as the meeting ended and they stood outside and were talking, there was a group of farmers. And one of the farmers said, I made 1,400 pound cotton last year. I made 230 bushels of corn. He said, I made 6,000 pounds plus peanuts. And he said, I barely broke even. And there was a lot of, lot of agreement with that. When we talk about 78 cent cotton, Bo, or whatever we're talking about the price of cotton day, it's hard to, hard to figure out how you're gonna make things make ends meet, okay? This affects me. How you doing? How you doing, all right? I have a lot of compliments about you, all right? One of the things that it makes hard for is no one's going to worry, or they're going to worry, but no one's going to cut back on seed. You know you've got to use herbicides. You know you've got insecticides. You know if you don't irrigate, you're not going to make your top yields. You know if you don't have insect management. So what gets harder for Bob and diseases and nematodes and cotton when there's worried about the price of cotton? And that is, can I convince you of what nematodes will? You don't have to be convinced of what pigweeds will do. You've seen them. You don't have to be convinced on stink bugs. <laughs> But sometimes you can convince yourself that nematodes aren't that important on my farm. The other thing is, in 2000, when I started, we didn't talk about spraying foliar applications of fungicide on cotton. And today, I'm going to tell you, if you want 200 to, or 100 to 200 pounds of extra cotton, you might need to spray. And that's coming on a year where growers are saying, already, I'm making 78 cent cotton. How can I afford to spray a fungicide? The question isn't how can you afford, is can you afford not to? And that's what we're going to talk to, talk to you about today, all right, as we get started. And I will be followed as well by Dr. Entiaz Chowdhury. He will also be talking a little bit at the end here. Chris Goodman, some of you all know Chris Goodman. Don't waste my time is his message, and so I don't want to do that. So welcome to this session, Disease and Nematode Management, an update going into 2024. At the bottom, you can't read it. That's Twitter or X, whatever it's called, KL Yarbrough. But if you follow me on that, no Philippines, no marbles, no arrowheads. It's all about diseases and nematode problems that we see in the field. Camp Hand. Camp Hand, our illustrious cotton team leader. He says, Bob, you are nothing but a fear monger. Okay, what's a fear monger? A fear monger is somebody who raises fear without reason, that benefits by people being afraid. Okay, he says I'm a fear monger because county agents, Kale, are afraid, growers are afraid that when they, before they close that furrow, if they haven't put a nematicide out, if they hadn't planted a nematode resistant variety, they're afraid to not spray for areola mildew because Bob talks about it being so important. That is not my message. My message is there, come on in the house, Mark, good to see you. My message is there is opportunity to improve yield by fighting nematodes, by fighting fusarium wilt, by fighting areola mildew and target spot. Think about this. If you are a football coach and you got 60 minutes of football ahead of you, and before the kickoff, you have to call every single play you're going to call the whole game. And you cannot deviate from that game plan. That's what nematodes are in cotton. Everything you're going to do for nematodes in cotton really has to be done before the kickoff. You have to have those plays in place. When you think about fusarium wilt, I'll tell you what, if I had known Dr. McCann was going to, I would have delayed starting just so he would be here when I started. Like you more crowds. I'm you, well, I do. I always need more people in here. Thanks for being here. That 60 minutes of game, if you don't fight the nematodes or fight the fusarium wilt or fight the bacterial blight before the game starts, you can't call any more plays for it. And that's not fear mongering, and that's reality, and that's why it's so important to me. The sky may not be falling, but if we don't do what's right, this picture from Bullock County, Bill, in 2017, this is a grower who called all his plays to fight nematodes, a susceptible variety, 1646, with three and a half pounds of ag logic. That was his play call before the kickoff. The kickoff happened, and Team Nematode cooked him. Every bit of everything that went into that ball game, every bit of insecticide, every bit of irrigation, every bit of everything, was lost because the wrong play was called before the ball was kicked. That's not fear mongering. That's the reality that I want you all to be aware of. Okay? What I want you to know when we leave here, 
A little bit out, out on Nino. Opportunities for nematode control. Yeah, we hear you, Bob. It's not fear monger, but we got one choice. I hear you. I understand. Okay, bacterial blight, Fusarium wilt, target spot, aerial, aerial mildew, and bull rot. When I started in 2000, I would have talked to you about seedling disease. Thanks to Richard's help, now I talk to you about nematodes. And thanks to whatever, target spot and aerial at mildew, it became a bigger problem. If you got questions, let me know. Okay. Winters of 2021, 2022, 2022, 2023, a three-peat of La Nina's. What do you care? Warmer and drier. In a La Nina year, in January the 14th, 2022, we had cotton blooming in Mitchell County. Cotton blooming. That means we are feeding nematodes in January. January 2022, we had corn covered up with tar spot in Tiff County. Disease debris or living hosts is feeding nematodes, it's feeding diseases as well. 2023, the 2nd of February, we had cotton germinating in this area. What's it doing? It's feeding nematodes, it's carrying diseases forward. Okay, all this may look familiar to you, or the next one will. 18th of January. We had high reniform populations, 2,000 plus in Bleckley County. And Kelly Yarbrough and Grady County, not to be outdone by Bleckley County, came back with high levels of root nut nematode. That is what a La Nina year will do. Nematodes don't go to bed. Cotton doesn't die. Residue remains. That's what happens. The good news is we are in an El Nino year. It doesn't really feel like it now, but last week when it was in the 20s, it was. Okay? My hope. My hope is that with the cooler, wetter weather that we can anticipate, may not be as cool and wet anymore, but we did have some colder weather and we will have wetter weather. Hopefully that will help us in several ways. Those nematodes that never went to bed for three years, Richard, I'm hoping at least they took a break. At least I hope they quit messing around. I hope they quit feeding. I hope they quit reproducing at least long enough to give us a break. That depends upon the soil temperature and how long it was cold. And it depends upon do we have susceptible hosts out there. Fortunately, a lot of the susceptible hosts may have frozen. But the other one that matters to me is better degradation of crop debris. Because if we have more rainfall, we'll have better degradation. And degradation of uh, crop debris with the rainfall will affect things like areola mildew. Areola mildew, we will talk about it. It survives in crop debris. When we talk about bacterial blight or angular leaf spot, that survives, that pathogen survives in crop debris. And when we talk about target spot, that survives in crop debris. So in an El Nino year, with cooler temperatures, hopefully at least we'll suppress the nematodes. They'll go to bed, Scott, a little bit earlier than they did last year. They never went to bed. And the second thing is, hopefully we'll have some degradation of crop debris. None of this helps you make management decisions for 2024, but what it helps you do is understand how the environment we're in right now may affect you. The one caution, one caution about El Nino, if it is cooler and wetter at planting time, do yourselves a favor, in addition to the seed treatment you use, in addition to possibly using a Zoxystrobe and furrow, recognize that if the soil temperatures will not be 65 degrees and above for the week ahead or following, following planting, don't plant if you can help it. The risk of seedling disease is too much. And if you are planting in cooler, wetter soils, a Zoxystrobe is a good way to help you against that guy. Okay? You get one chance on that. Okay? Every cotton grower in this room will politely listen to me when I talk about nematodes and nod their heads in agreement. You'll say, well, we've heard that about seedling disease before, but you'll listen. But what you really want me to do is tell you how to fight bull rot. And I can tell you bull rot wasn't bad last year for most of the state. Why is that? Market was hot and dry. Hot and dry. If it's not, if we have wetter weather, we have storms coming through, there's not much we can do. We have fungicides that work against the pathogens. We just cannot get them in enough concentration for long enough where they need to be. We cannot fight bull rot. That's the truth. I wish we could. But what I want to tell you is there is one bull rot that we can fight. We can eliminate. Bacterial bull rot. Bacterial blight. If bacterial blight is a problem for you, if you are worried about it, we can eliminate it, and we can eliminate that by planting resistant varieties. 
If you said bacterial boil rot's never been a problem on my field since uh, 2015, I'm not worried about it, don't worry about it. But the only way we can for 100% sure eliminate it is to plant a resistant variety. The only point of this slide is your phytogen varieties are resistant, but now Stoneville and Delta Pine and others are coming forward. You have that opportunity. If it's a wet year, if we can't predict the future, but if it turns out to be a wet year, bacterial blight can be more severe and a susceptible variety could get punished. Okay? It's not fear mongering, it's planning, it's careful planning, right? We can eliminate bacterial bull rot, we can't eliminate the others. And we eliminate it by the decision you make at planting time. Kale sent me this picture. Didn't you send me that picture, Kale, back in December? He was proud. Showing me he's out working in December. Everybody else is on Christmas break. Kale's out working. There's no strain. Like two, weeks two weeks ago. It feels like a month ago. All right? Well, I appreciate it, Kale. Don't, don't interrupt my stories. Just let me keep. <laughs> you know, don't let the facts stand in the way of a good story. All right? Don't you have someplace else to be? That's what it looks like up close and personal. This is what it looks like in your field. And for every cotton grower in this room who's going to plant or refuses to plant a resistant variety, this is what you may be faced with on either side. That is a susceptible, high-yield, root-knot, nematode-susceptible variety with some of our nematicides. Not knocking nematicides, but this is what happens. This is a resistant variety. And for all those reasons I know, you say, well, I may not plant one. Just be aware that this is what happens. These are susceptible varieties with nematicides. Sometimes they don't look that bad. Okay? This is a tough field, but that's what a resistant variety looks like. And it really doesn't matter which resistant variety it is as far as that stage goes. Okay? Another thing to consider, that choice of a nematicide and what variety you plant, you get one chance for. This is a field, that same guy who said, don't waste my time. He had somebody planting his crop last year. Okay? What's the difference between this and that? It's not variety. It's not planting date. It's nothing. There, it's the same everything with one exception. And if you look at this, this is where he made a change. Anybody got an idea what that is? The change was he recognized that whoever was planting here was planting. They went with last year's 2022's lines. They were planting the cotton exactly where it was the year before. And here's where he caught it, and he moved him over 18 inches. This is not magic. Another thing you could do is just make sure that you're not planting directly back into the same root zone you were last year. It didn't make as big of a difference as you thought, as I thought it would. It was about 150 to 200 pounds of lint, but that was 18 inches, gave him 200 pounds of lint. Okay? You may not do that. But just make sure nobody else does it as well, because the nematodes are going to be at the most concentrated point in that root zone where they were last year. Root knot, you need no introduction. Reniform, I used to think reniform was an Alabama problem. I used to think it was a northeast Georgia problem. Reniform, nematode, kale, again, to pick on kale. And if this is not true, you just keep it to yourself, okay? Just keep it to yourself. Nobody wants your opinion today, all right? Kale can show you, this is not him, this is Washington County, but Kale and Grady County and other counties as well, we're starting to see reniform nematode creep in, okay? And when reniform creeps in, that's important to know because your management tools, especially your variety, you have opportunity with your varieties that when it's reniform, some of your root knot nematode resistant varieties would not work as well, would not work any different than a susceptible variety. So it's very, very important to know what you have, okay? Why do I keep talking about nematodes? I don't have to talk about pigweed because you, you don't need to be schooled about that. You don't need to be schooled about uh, stink bugs. You don't have to be schooled about yield. You know those things. You don't have to be schooled about the need for nitrogen and potassium. But sometimes with cotton 78 cent, you think, well, do I really need a nematocyte? And then you start to think, well, what's the value of a nematode-resistant variety if it's not going to yield that much different on camp hands of OBT trials. Okay? I talk about it because there's opportunity out there. And we need to recognize that in addition to yield, there's not drops in nematode numbers, there's yield, and there is no expense for the nematocyte. Okay? That's why we talk about it. Don't forget this. 
when you plant a root night nematode resistant variety, whether it's a phytogen or a new DPL or a stoneville or a dynagro, that's what your root system looks like under root night nematodes. That's what a susceptible variety looks like. What's the value there? You're not growing roots, you're growing lent. Better root function, better uptake of nutrients, better potential for yield, less nematode buildup. That's value in addition to the Y word, right? From 2023, all right, the 411, the 443, the 332, all root knot and nematode, root knot and reniform resistant, 2141, also root knot and reniform resistant. This is out of the Panhandle, Florida, a couple years ago. This is 443, this is 1646 in a reniform environment, <clears throat> okay? The biggest point about this slide is not convincing you of root knot versus reniform resistance. It is that you have a decision to make, two decisions to make. Your decisions to make is, are you going to use a nematode resistant variety? And the second thing is, does the fact that it says W3FE or B3XF, does that bother you? Is that a deal breaker for you? Tim, for you, it's not a deal breaker, right? You got your decisions. John, is that you in the back? I got bad eyesight. It's not a bad, you know, funny the two of you all sit together. It's, it's team phytogen back there, okay? What I would say is you need to look and see. In addition to whatever your thoughts are on the technology, what is the power of bacterial blight? What's the power of resistance that comes? I would ask you as the plant pathologist acting as a nematologist, Richard, is that you look and you say, what's the value? And I would ask you not to solely decide it based upon B3XF or W3FE. And going forward, don't waste my time, Chris says, what's new? All right, in 2024, 2349, there was a little bit of that last, week, uh, last year. Only root knot, but Delta Pines got some bacterial blight. 6,000, only root knot, but got bacterial blight resistance as well. Those are new things for them. Dynagru, 3644, root knot and reniform resistance. And then a whole slate from phytogen, but the one I want to point out, the most of you can't read back there, 475 is root knot and reniform resistant. I'll show you some data on that in a minute. 475 is our new one for this year. John, I think you said, told me you plant 411. Is that right? Did you plant 411 in my favorite golden pantry field? All right. So when you go into Athens, my favorite fields are the ones next to Bucky's and Warner Robins and the one next to uh, Golden Pantry and Bishop. And that field last year was 411. All right? Any questions on that? You got opportunity. If you are not, if you are not going to plant a resistant variety in 2024 and you have nematode problems, root knot or reniform, I ask you to use nematicide. When I started, you get one chance. When I started in 20, or 20, uh, 2000, Telone was $12 a gallon. You won't come close to that now. But Telone remains the toughest product we got out there. Plant a resistant variety, you don't have to worry about it, okay? But if you don't, you gotta worry about it, okay? We've got AgLogic, Vellum, and we now have, in addition to those, we have Averland, okay? We've looked at AgLogic for a lot of time, a lot of years. You're familiar with it. Okay, we have looked at vellum for a number of years. Coming in 2023 and now in 2024 is Averland. It's been used on corn. We have very little da data, Eric, on that one. Okay, but what I can say is it performs similar to vellum in the fact, Richard, that the abamectin does not move much in the soil like the fluopyram does. Neither one moves very much. Aglogic does move, sometimes too much. Okay, doesn't move much. Okay, that's a similarity. Limited data, we've seen a lot on seed treatments, but in the data we do have, it's performed more or less like the vellum does, and you can mix it with fertilizers if that was a good idea to do, okay? What's my greatest confidence? AgLogic and vellum. Vitae could be a foliar application. Averland is out there, and it's something that increased data will show us what it can do, okay? Questions on that? A little bit of data for you. This is from Colquitt County in 2022. Green bar, 1646, three and a half pounds of ag logic. Maroon bar, 1646 with five pounds. 
Gold bar, 1646 plus ag logic plus a foliar application of by date. These are your root knot reniform resistant varieties in a root knot field. Nematode populations. All above threshold if you plant the susceptible, no matter what nematicide, all below threshold or well below threshold if you use a resistant variety. Okay? That's one of the values. When we look at yield, all right, three and a half pounds under 1646, five pounds under 1646, it was the second highest yield in the test. 1646 plus ag logic works in most situations. But if you go from purple that way, those are the resistant varieties with no nematicide. Yes, we got to control thrips, okay? So what's the value? Well, Bob, here's the 2141. Actually, yeah, the 2141 was the highest yield, not significantly different. Why not just go with the Ag Logic 1646 in this trial? You could. It's not a mistake. But what's the value going with the resistant varieties? No significant difference in yield, no additional cost for nematicide, and you didn't build nematodes up for the following year. No fear of mongering. You can make your decision. Here's a trial out of Screven County last year, okay? Must be true, it came out of Screven County. Just want to show you up at the top, Stonewall 5091 with Ag Logic 1021. Phytogen B437, that is now the Phytogen 475 with root knot and reniform resistance. It was the second leading variety in that trial, and we got other root knot and reniform resistant varieties in here. Here's 3799 with Ag Logic and without Ag Logic. Here's 2127 without Ag Logic and with Ag Logic. Okay? The point here is that one trial, one unfarmed, unfarmed trial in a root knot nematode environment, phytogen 475 is an example of what a root knot reniform resistant variety can do in the right environment. Does it happen every time? No. All I am trying to do is get those who are still on the fence and whether I should try it or not to try it. Be aware you got opportunities. And if you bristle at W3FE, we got the others as well. But try it, okay? Questions on that? In reniform fields, and John, this is where I would say your fields are exciting to me, okay? Also, they're across from Golden Pantry. By the way, if you ever want to try and take a picture of his field, don't go into the field because you'll never get out. The traffic is so bad getting out of that field. Stand at the Golden Pantry and take a picture across the road. Ask me how I know, okay? Don't do it. With reniform resistant varieties, 3799, this is KLR Bros data right here. 3799 Ag Logic, 3799 with Ag Logic, 2141, 3644, and 411. These are reniform resistant varieties, Richard, as you know. Unlike root knot varieties, we don't knock the nematode populations down near as much with a reniform resistant variety. But what we see, in my opinion, as consistently or more consistently, okay? is that here's 3799 without ag logic 3799 with ag logic this is grady county last year here's 2141 3644 and 411. you don't knock the nematodes down quite as much or near as much as you do with root knot re resistance but we are even more likely to see yield advantage okay bill tyson in the back bill has similar trials for root knot nematode that we've seen here not for much for the reniform, but he has the same kind of trials. I want to thank the county agents for putting those together. Questions on that? Am I trying to sell anything? No. I'm trying, well, I am. I'm trying, Rodney, I'm trying to sell the idea that you have a chance, a choice. Okay? And whether you put out a nematicide or you plant a resistant variety and what technology you've got, you've got that one single chance to do it. Ariel at Mildew. Prior to 2017, it stayed home. It stayed home in southeast Georgia. It rarely crossed I-75. In 2016-17, something changed. I suspect that we got more susceptible varieties, which has let it go all the way to Virginia, all the way to Tennessee, and when things really matter, when they get to Mississippi. Okay? Until something gets to Mississippi, I don't think they really matter. Okay? But they gather now. If you are worried about 78-cent cotton, I don't blame you. If you are thinking the last thing in the world you want to do is add an additional fungicide, I don't blame you. But if 100 to 200 pounds of lint on every UGA trial we've ever done on this on-farm trial, except where the fields were compromised by drought or fertility or nematodes, 
then you should pay attention. If 100 to 200 pounds of lint don't matter to you, then don't worry about it. Up until last year, up until this year, really, here was our list. Here's what's labeled. We were recommending headline, is oxystrobin or quadris preaxial or miravis top. For areolate mildew, they were either fair to good or excellent in controlling this disease. And you can see out of 2021, actually, 51 days after a single application, we usually apply either the third to fourth week of bloom or prior to a month before, uh, before defoliation. Untreated, 72% defoliated. Azoxystrobin, 45. Miravis top, 16. 10% with preaxor. This is what we've been seeing. Azoxystrobin is attractive. Why? Because it's good but not great, but it's also cheap. It's still cheap. All right, in a situation like this, we made 100 pounds of lint with the preaxial and the mirvus top. We've made more, not much difference, a little bit with the azoxystrobin. Enough to certainly pay for it. <coughs> Jump ahead. Bullock County, 2023. Colquitt County, 2023. 48 days after ap application. 50% defoliated with the untreated, 46% with the azoxystrobin. And your trial bill, it was exactly the same. 10% with the Miravis top, 8% with the Preaxor. What's that look like in the field? This is Colquitt County. Here's the untreated. Here's the azoxystrobin. White is not good in this situation. Why? Because it's premature defoliation, which affects how we open that top crop. If you look at harvest, and again, these are mirror images, Bill, from Bullock County. Untreated, Miravis top, azoxystrobin. Something's changed, at least last year, in two distant cotton fields. And so what I'm worried about going in is not do we still need to spray because the difference between azoxystrobin and spraying pre or Miravis top was 150 pounds of lint. What I'm worried about is that what we could spray, which was good but not great, may not be even good anymore. The biggest change this year is going to be what we're going to recommend as far as applications. Miravis top and preaxor, we still recommend with great confidence, but unfortunately they're more expensive. Azoxystrobin, we do not recommend until we have further data because it seems from two widespread studies last year, and including BJ, what happened in uh, the Stripling Irrigation Park may not be as good as it once was. What I need you to know, okay? That climate's helping you out for a lot of reasons. We need more colder, wetter weather. What I need you to know is that opportunity for nematodes, okay? The opportunity for nematode management comes one time. What I need you to know is there are growers in this room who plant resistant varieties and are satisfied with them. There are growers in this room who choose not to plant resistant varieties and they're satisfied with it as well. When you look at the value in a nematode <laughs> variety, it is in reduction nematode populations for root knot that you don't use the nematicide and yield that's at least equal to susceptible varieties with the nematicide. If you look at Camp Han's data, and I know you will, and it looks like that his susceptible varieties are at the top and my resistant varieties that I talk about are lower down, ask what kind of field they were in, Richard. Entiaz, you put these varieties where they need to be, we like them, okay? Bacterial blight, if it's gonna be a problem, you've got one chance. We have an increasing number of varieties with resistance. Fusarium wilt management, I didn't talk too much about that, but again, that is a resistant variety. Target spot and aerial lip mildew, do you need a fungicide program? I don't have to convince you to control weeds. I don't have to convince you to put out nitrogen. I don't have to convince you to control insects. If 100 to 200 pounds of lint is not worth your time and effort, then I wouldn't worry about it. But if that profit, or if that is what's on top of what you need to make, to make a profit, then by all means, a single application certainly for the aerial lip builder will be enough, right? That's what I've got is I'm turning it over now to Intiaz. He's got something he wants to talk to you about, something new as far as nematodes go. Come on up. To identify, wait, the next big thing in terms of disease nematode management in Good morning, everyone. Um, so let's get started. It'll be a pretty short talk. 
As Bob says, I'm factory tra trained, so I got to tell you a little bit about nematode biology, just so that it makes sense what we talk about after. Bob talked about nematodes a lot already. So what are nematodes? Nematodes are multicellular roundworms that have existed for millions of years. They're unsegmented, you know, the earthworms that we see, they're segmented throughout. And these nematodes, some of them are plant parasitic and some of them are not. Uh, some of them attacks us. Uh, on the other hand, the fortunate thing is the ones that attack us don't attack the plant. The ones that attack plant don't attack us. Um, so the ones that attack plants, plant parasitic nematodes, have a spear-like shaft in their mouth called a stylet. They use that to puncture a hole into the root system of your crop and extract nutrient from them. Um, some of them actually penetrate the roots it themselves uh, and go inside and make a house. Um, some remain warm like their whole life. Some actually become uh, swell up as they become an adult with a bunch of eggs inside them. So these types of nematodes are the ones we call root knot nematodes. Um, they're actually considered, as you all know, the most devastating group of nematodes because they're so widespread and so damaging. And their life cycle looks something like this. They start as an egg and then they hatch into a juvenile. These juveniles are the ones that goes around in the soil to find a root system. So as we do sampling and we give you the nematode counts, we are actually giving you this in the number of juveniles that were in the soil. And so then they enter the root system itself, sets up a house and uh, swells up uh, to form um, galls. That's why I use the analogy of a house because you know it's a big structure they form in the roots. And so there are different species of root knot nematode. It's not just a one type of nematode. So the most common one that we are all talking about, uh, Bob is talking about, is the southern root knot nematode. That's what we see everywhere down here in the south. Uh, we also have peanut root knot nematode and Javanese root knot nematode. And you have probably, most probably heard about them as well. But recently, we have detected in Georgia three new species. There are guava root knot nematodes, peach root knot nematodes, and uh, Texas root knot nematodes. I'll talk more about them in a little bit. Um, but why is this important? Why do you need to know about uh, uh, all these? Uh, uh, why are nematodes important? Why do I have a job? As you all know, they, you are not alone in losses faced because of nematode. Worldwide, 100 to $157 billion is lost because of nematodes annually. But the important thing is the extent of damage caused by plant parasitic nematodes can really vary depending on the species uh, or, uh, or type of nematode you have. For example, uh, at, uh, even at low population numbers, root knot num nematodes are very damaging. Uh, in vegetables, up to 50% yield loss is not uncommon. Whereas at low population number, the damage potential for spiral nematodes are almost negligible. That's another type of nematode. So losses also depend on the host crop, nematode species, soil type, environment. And these are all important things to consider and understand when it comes to management. So another Im uh, interesting thing is nematodes often escape management because symptoms caused by nematodes are not unique. So anything that takes out nutrient from your crop will cause symptoms that are similar to the symptoms nematode cause. So uh, often we don't know nematodes are an issue. So sampling is critical. Uh, it's, uh, it's the way you can tell you have a problem. Once you know you have a problem, you can undergo, do some management. So it costs only $15, uh, but the benefits are manifold. I can't uh, emphasize this more. Uh, But let's talk about something that won't cost you any money uh, at all. Um, uh, recently, Georgia Cotton Commission has funded a uh, uh, Georgia Cotton Field Survey for plant parasitic nematode work. And we have three objectives here. We wanted to evaluate incidence, abundance, and distribution of plant parasitic nematodes in 150 cotton fields, determine whether aggressive species, such as the ones we newly detected species we talked about, is uh, uh, infesting cotton fields of Georgia and investigate whether 
uh, uh, environmental factors like soil properties and weather makes a difference, what will that will in, uh, essentially enable us to do, in a sense, predict if uh, the uh, type of issues you will have with nematodes depending on the region your field belongs to. So, w the findings of this research, including the nematode count and the species identity data, will be provided to the growers from whom we collect the soil samples from, uh, with some uh, recommendations as well. So, we would really um, encourage you to participate in this program. We'll utilize our ext excellent group of extension uh, agents to collect these soil samples. Some have already done this. Both me and Dr. Kemerite are working on this, and I think we will find some very important information from there. With that, let's move on to the new species I talked about. So, one of them is guava root knot nematodes. Um, their scientific name is Maldegain enterolobii. From 2021 to 2023, uh, they have been detected in Lowndes County, one field in Lowndes County, County and another field in Tatnall County. On the other hand, peach root knot nematode, um, Maldegain floridensis, this nematode has been detected in five fields in Dooley, Crisp, Wilcox, Turner, and Ware County. So the other one doesn't attack, uh, as far as we know so far, cotton, so we'll talk about it another time. Um, so why is the scientific community concerned with that, or why should we be concerned with them? Well, for that, uh, when it comes to nematode management, let me tell you about the four pillars of nematode management. That is host resistance, cotton uh, crop rotation, nematicides, and cultural practices. And when it comes to host resistance, as you know, resistance genes has been introduced into several of the major cr varied, uh, crops, uh, including cotton as well as some vegetable crops. These ge resistance genes are not effective against these new species that we are uh, talking about. Uh, and currently, there is no commercial varieties that have resistance genes against these nematodes. And uh, these nematodes are pretty highly virulent. Uh, this is a work that we did uh, last year, towards the end of last year. And it's just a one trial. We have yet to validate it. It's a greenhouse trial, so many different things. But all I uh, wanted to show from here is that we looked at some resistant varieties and susceptible varieties against uh, guava root knot nematode and peach root knot nematode. And you can see in all of them it reproduced. On the y-axis here, it's a reproduction factor, just a way to measure how much they reproduce. And you can see it did, rep did reproduce. But we, need, we are yet to validate and confirm this. So um, back uh, to crop rotation. So guava root knot nematode and peach root knot nematode have a wider host range. So that's another concerning issue. So um, it includes most vegetable crops, numerous row crops. So when it comes to your choice of rotational crop, it's, it gets limited. So um, for guava root knot nematode, the, the good thing is it does not attack peanuts. Um, but uh, peach root knot nematodes does attack peanuts or reproduce on peanuts. Um, another concerning thing is it's a, a pr uh, spreading at an alarming rate throughout the U.S. Guava root knot nematode is very widespread in North Carolina. If you grow, uh, talk to any of your friends from North Carolina, uh, they'll tell you about guava root knot nematode. It's a big issue there. Um, and in Florida also, it's uh, everywhere. Inclu peach root knot nematode as well, in, uh, uh, everywhere in Florida. Um, this is another work that, ha that has been co uh, conducted in North Car uh, Carolina. I just pulled up this table just to show you an example, a good news actually. The chemicals that does work against southern root knot nematode does work against guava root knot nematode. This is on sweet potato and it has almost similar efficacy between the two. That's all I wanted to show there because it's a different cropping system different place, so there will be some differences, but we don't expect big difference that something works and something doesn't work at all. So in conclusion, there are, this is something I always like to talk about. In history, there are very few examples of successful prevention of nematode spread, but we can slow its spread and we can be prepared. To slow its spread, exclusion meaning uh, uh, keeping it out of your field is the best medicine. Um, 
uh, another uh, an interesting thing both the fields where we found guava root knot nematodes had sweet potato uh, being grown there and it was grown with transplant collected from outside the state so it's very important to be uh, purchase seeds and transplant not the for the case for uh, cotton but for your other crops your rotational crops to get it from reputable sources, inspect them, um, adopt good sanitation practices. So as you go from field to field, that's the nematodes don't move by themselves uh, that far. It's only humans or other animals that can take it from a field to field, that long distance movement. <coughs> We can be prepared and we are working towards that. We can, uh, and for that, we need to develop management uh, strategies that are tailored to this region and our cropping system. And so we're doing that. And uh, if you already have an infested field, what do you do then? Well, you, for guava root, not nematodes, fortunately, you can rotate with corn, peanut, sorghum, small and small grains, and you'll get some good suppression there. Um, uh, you can apply nematicides uh, and fumigants and it's very important to monitor for damage and assess risk regularly. Again, that sampling thing comes up. So with that, uh, thank you very much for your time. Pretty short. Uh, any questions? Yes. Could you repeat that? Sorry. Yes. Oh, that's a very good question. Uh, so her question was about typically when you send a soil sample to the lab, they'll give you a nematode count. They'll tell you root knot nematodes there. Um, they won't do the species identification, the different species I was talking about. And you can get that done if you pay them some extra money. Uh, but this work that we are talking about that we will do we will do the species identification as well that will take us a little bit couple more uh, a month or two more but it's part of the plan and we will let you let you know on uh, on the species i already had um i think uh, i forgot the, the name but uh, extension agent calling me about the species because the grower is thinking about rotating with peanuts and we're working towards that so yes we will tell you uh, the species identity as well for this work uh, the survey work. Any other questions for Dr. Chowdhury? Any other questions? Okay. Right. Ken, you know how much phytogen cotton Tim Hall grows? I have no idea. But you know who Tim Hall is? He's the, uh, he's not you. Tim Hall is a retired county agent out of Irwin County. And for some reason today, I was saying Tim instead of Ken, but I don't think Tim grows any. <laughs> Five G cotton, but Ken certainly John does as well. <laughs> and what I'm going to say at this point is thank you, Dr. Chowdhury. Good point that came up was that when you turn in samples to UGA or to Waters Lab, visually they can tell whether you've got root knot nematodes, but or they can soil and fertility. say that one more time. Right, soil and right, soil and fertility. We don't want to miss any. This is like NASCAR, right? Which how do we wear it? But you're right. When you turn those samples in, they will tell you they got root knot nematode, but visually, they can't tell the difference between which species it is. That's a more complex issue. Georgia Cotton Commission is funding NTIs and his team to make the decision on to go further and look at that. Okay? So what I want to leave you all with is thanks for being here today. I want to leave you with that we are at the University of Georgia. We're moving forward. Dr. McCann, we are not just doing what we've always done. We're moving forward trying to be preemptive and what the problems are. But when you look at your management plans for 2024, recognize I can't affect the price of cotton. But I can, with extension, help you protect the yield potential you have. Protect every bit of every input you put into it can be taken away if you don't fight nematodes, if you don't fight fusarium wilt, if you don't fight bacterial blight, if you don't fight foliar diseases. Bill Tyson, that's not fear-mongering, that is the truth. What you need to do depends upon your unique situation. All right, any questions for me or for Dr. Chowdhury? I want to thank the county agents for all they've done. I appreciate you all being here, and I think the next class will start. Oh, come on in, Cale. You missed some exciting stuff. Come on in the house. All right, we got the, uh, the next one starts at 9 o'clock. Appreciate you all being here.